Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really excited for today's show. Uh, it's going to be a good one. We've got a uh, really uh, great guest on. Really excited for this one uh, with Mike Bechtold, a uh, great historian. A lot of you know him from his work, Stuff Online. He's really always got great stuff on Twitter. So that is always great to see. So, hey, Mike, how's it going today? Hey, Brad. Thanks very much for having me on. Really uh, looking yeah, forward. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. This is a really good way of, I think, looking at Normandy. I mean, it can be a, a bit confusing uh, with all the stuff that's going on. So we're going to take a, an approach of looking at the 7th Brigade, but we're going to start, like we were talking earlier, about just kind of do a high level, and then we'll move into the more um, specific stuff. So Great. just yeah. give me a second here. I'm going to get our... Get your PowerPoint going here. There we go. Wonderful. Perfect. All right. So uh, hello, everybody out in uh, cyber world, wherever you may be. I hope uh, everybody's enjoying their uh, Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening, wherever you may be, maybe even uh, Saturday morning if you're on our West Coast. Um, but uh, I want to spend the next 45 minutes or an hour or so talking to you about uh, the, the Canadians in Normandy and, and in particular, what was going on with uh, the 7th Canadian Infantry Brigade, because I think in in many ways, this is one of the most important battles that the, uh, the Canadians fought um, during the Normandy campaign. Uh, D-Day obviously is right up there. It was uh, absolutely crucial about getting ashore and, and getting uh, feet dry and, and not getting pushed back in. But uh, the early battles were, were very crucial. And uh, the one I want to talk to you about today is the, the stand of the 7th Canadian Infantry Brigade at uh, Breadville, Norrie and uh, Puto from the, uh, the 7th to the 10th of June. And uh, if you uh, if you don't know a lot about those battles, you're uh, you're certainly not alone. They haven't got a lot of coverage in uh, uh, the, the histories of the battle, you won't find much in uh, Hastings or um, uh, even C.P. Stacy covers it very quickly, the, the Canadian official historian. Uh, John English kind of writes it off. Uh, John A. English writes it off pretty quickly in his book on uh, failure and high command. Um, and uh, you, you will get some of it in uh, Mark Milner's uh, recent book on uh, Stopping the Panzers, which is a fantastic account. Uh, Terry Kopp covers it in, in Fields of Fire. But uh, it, it's really only in the last uh, 10 or 15 years that we've begun to understand how important these battles were and uh, how uh, crucial um, the stand of these green troops, because remember, this was... Uh, 3rd Canadian Infantry Division's first battle. They've never been uh, engaged before. Uh, everybody talks about how weak um, new troops are, and this is uh, after D-Day, their, their first major battle, yet they uh, they give a, a really good accounting of themselves, especially considering who their, their opposition was. Um, Brad, we've uh, talked at length about uh, the, the 12th yeah. SS Hitler Youth Division. Um, it is uh, portrayed as, as one of these elite divisions. It is a showcase division. It has sort of the best of everything. It's fully up to strength, which a lot of German divisions are, has all its tanks, all its equipment, all its artillery, um, all of its uh, infantry battalions and infantry companies are up to full strength. They have full allotments of uh, machine guns and rifles and lots of grenades and, and everything you need to be a, a fighting division. And uh, it has experienced officers and NCOs who have been plucked from the Eastern Front and, and brought to the Western Front. And it has the cream of the, the Hitler youth, the, um, uh, the young lads who were sort of indoctrinated in, in Nazism since they, uh, they turned 10 or 11 or 12, grew up yeah. in this, this Hitler youth um, system, which was kind of like their equivalent of, of the Boy Scouts. Um, except instead of uh, making knots and, and uh, model airplanes like I did when I was in Scouts, they're uh, learning field craft and how to uh, uh, give a, a Heil Hitler and, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So they yeah. were very fit. They were very young. Um, they were reasonably well trained. Um, but above all, they had been trained to think that uh, the Aryan um, brotherhood, the Aryan nation was the cream of the cream and nobody could stand against them. Their officers told them that, their NCOs told them that, and uh, when they came into battle, they expected to uh, to roll over the Canadians. As um, Kurt Meyer said on the, uh, the afternoon of D-Day, he said, we're going to throw these little fish back into the sea. And uh, as it turned out, those little fish had some darn mighty big teeth that uh, took a chunk out of 12th SS. So that's what I, I want to talk with you about here today. 
perfect. Yeah, that sounds great. This is going to be a, a good one. We got lots of information to cover, so, um, but in an engaging way, uh, we got lots of good visuals. So, but if anyone has questions or anything or needs clarifications, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, we're not at a conference academic stuffiness here, so we can stop and look and do whatever we need to do. So if anyone has any questions along the way, please fire away. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, don't don't hesitate to throw a question into the uh, the chat, and uh, Brad will keep an eye on that while I'm uh, talking, and we can uh, slow down and, and go over something in more detail if uh, if you have questions or or take it in a different direction. We don't need to be on any kind of a, a schedule or, or a plan here today. Exactly. All right. All right. So next slide. So this is I've kind of gone over this in a sort of a general way, but this is what you see in the in the history books um, that the air and naval bombardment was what made D-Day possible. Um, they talk about uh, this direct line from Dieppe to D-Day that uh, the failure at Dieppe, the lessons learned because of it. Um, caused success at uh, at Juneau Beach, and even if you read the um, the letter from General Crerar to his uh, his men that day, he's he's drawing that direct link, saying that uh, the lessons we learned at uh, Dieppe uh, made D Day or will make our, our D Day landings a success, and you see that in a, a lot of books, and uh, that's probably a good topic for uh, another um, program because uh, I think there's a, a lot to dig into there. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, big time. <laughs> cold note version of that. Sorry, I'm dating myself. Um, but the, the the short version of that is that really there is no direct link between uh, DA and, and DF. There was a lot of stuff that went wrong at DF. A lot of it was corrected by DA, but it's not a sort of a direct route of because it went wrong there, we fixed it for 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 Normandy. There was a a lot of other operations, a lot of other planning, a lot of other. Uh, um, amphibious operations where they gained experience, so it wasn't that kind of a straight line. Um, lack of exploitation on D-Day, you've probably heard Montgomery um, slammed for not capturing Khan on uh, D-Day. Drop our first uh, Saving Private Ryan uh, reference here, <laughs> where he gets uh, uh, slammed yeah. by uh, uh, Ted Danson, and uh, cheers Ted Danson. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, there's there's a good reason for that, and we'll, we'll talk about that quickly. I think I got that screenshot saved somewhere on my computer for <laughs> Twitter discussions. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Um, the Allies won through brute force. This is a, an idea that goes way back, and uh, John Ellis probably is the the more most forthright. Um, historian talking about this. He's got a book called Brute Force, and he talks about the fact that the Allies had no finesse, they had no skill, they didn't have the great equipment that the Germans had, and that uh, if it had come down to an equal fight, I'm not exactly sure what an equal fight is or why you even want an equal fight, um, but if it had been an equal fight that uh, the Germans would have defeated the Allies hands down, well, I have serious problems with that. Um, Yes, the Allies had more tanks, more planes, more ships, more bullets and everything like that. But I don't think that is the only reason they won. Um, if you look at the individual battles, and I think that's where um, studies like the one we're going to talk about today are so important. Because if you look at what's happening on the ground, in a, in a macro level, on a sort of the big picture, yes, brute force is important. Numbers are important. Mass is important. But if you get down to the, the tactical level and look at what's happening on the battlefield, you'll see that all these ideas of, of mass and numerical superiority really don't have much of a place and it comes down to the skill of the individual soldiers and uh, one for one I would put any British, Canadian or American soldier against any uh, German soldier whether it be uh, a, sort of a typical uh, a soldier from the, the Wehrmacht or uh, an elite soldier and I'm putting that in air quotes from uh, the 12th SS. Yeah. Sorry, um, I just got, not to cut you off real quick, though, but I think that's why, and we'll get to why that's so important when we look at certain engagements. But I just want to throw it out there that we will get into why that's the case. Like what Mike just said, um, there's lots of engagements that prove that time and time again. This isn't us just, you know, throwing that out there to try and, you know, make an image of, you know, the Canadians looking better or something. That's not our objective here. It's just that's what's the case. No, sorry, no, sorry, Mike, continue it, on. It's certainly, there, there's certainly not a nationalistic angle to this. It's... Um, no. Yes, I'm talking about the Canadians. Yes, I'm talking about something they did right. Um, part of me is if we don't talk about it, then nobody else will. Um, right. We can't uh, count on the, the Americans or the, the British to tell our stories. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they do a great job. Sometimes we're just uh, a footnote and uh, not a, an important part of the story. So we do have to tell our own stories. 
But we don't tell our own stories to make ourselves more important. We tell our stories to make sure we're part of that narrative that we do uh, get credit for what we did, what we achieved, and and the role we played in in that important victory that was uh, the D-Day campaign. Exactly. So, yeah, missed opportunities and a, a tarnished victory at, at Flez. Those are maybe going a little bit beyond what we're talking about today, but uh, they are certainly part of the, the narrative. So if we can go to the next slide, and we'll just uh, sort of click through that. Um, in terms of, uh, I just want to sort of set the stage. Um, this is the, the Normandy bridgehead area where the, the D-Day invasion took place, Operation Neptune, and Operation Overlord. Um, started late on the uh, evening of the, the 5th of June, um, 73, no, sorry, 77 years ago today. The, uh, the men would have been marshalling in the UK, getting on planes, and uh, the first paratroopers were landing um, on the, the Cotentin Peninsula. Uh, the US 82nd and, and 101st Airborne Divisions coming down mostly behind Utah Beach. The, uh, the British 6th Airborne Division coming down on the, uh, the eastern flank, the, the left flank, of the Allied Seaborne Army's uh, air invasion. And of course that includes the, the man of the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion that had a couple of important bridges to capture um, and supporting the uh, the capture of Pegasus Bridge and, and the Merville Battery. And then the, the five invasion beaches, the uh, the two American beaches, Omaha and Utah, the, the two British beaches, Sword and, Ju uh, Sword and Gold, and then the one that we're most interested in, Juneau Beach, where the uh, the Canadians landed. And I like to get the uh, the red ensign there instead <laughs> of our, our modern uh, Canadian flag. Uh, I'm very proud of our Canadian flag, but uh, in 1944, that uh, flag was still a uh, uh, sometime in the future. And this is the uh, the actual flag that we fought under at that time. It's still a hot topic debated even today. <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, it's one of my pet peeves. I, I mean, I understand when you see a book or a map that's drawn and they, they put the Canadian flag on there. Um, people understand that. They know that uh, yeah. symbol and what it represents, but it, it just kind of grates a little bit because it's a historical. It wasn't around then, so yeah, exactly. my feeling exactly. is I shouldn't have used it then. But anyway, that's just one yeah. of my little uh, uh, rants that I... Yeah, we digress anyway. <laughs> exactly. So... Um, so the, the invasion, the Seaborne invasion, took place um, starting around 6 a.m., 6.30, 7 a.m. on the, the 6th of June. And for the most part, it was entirely successful. Um, you know the story of, of Omaha. That was the closest of the, uh, the beaches to failure at one point. Um, uh, the American generals, I guess it was Bradley, was uh, considering... Um, um, pulling the Americans off, but they kept at it. And by the uh, late afternoon, they were getting up into the bluffs and uh, turned Omaha into a, a success. Um, Juneau um, was probably the second most difficult uh, beach to be uh, captured on, on D-Day. And again, that's a story we could uh, spin off into another uh, entire yeah. program. And uh, I know Brad's going to be uh, talking with uh, Paul um, at World War II TV about uh, uh, the uh, first Azars on D-Day in tomorrow. Is that tomorrow? That's correct. Yeah, 8 a.m. Yeah. Eastern time. So that's 2 p.m. Uh, French time, yes. Awesome. So, yeah. And there's a link tomorrow. to that in the description for anybody who's interested. Perfect. You should uh, check out that because we're going to be talking about the first Azars, but uh, Brad will give you a, a great account of their uh, their landings on D-Day. Um, Canadians got ashore. Uh, they took very heavy casualties. Um, calculating casualties is, is a little bit difficult. Um, the, yeah. uh, the number is usually given as, uh, what is it, 347 Canadians were killed on D-Day. Yeah. Um, 300, sorry, 340 were killed on Juneau Beach on D-Day. Yeah. Um, except it's, that's the casualty figure for the entire 24-hour period. Mm -hmm. um, and includes the, the early battles inland. So we don't really know how many were killed yeah. in invasion. Um, the numbers for Omaha are pretty similar, but if you look at the number of troops deployed and kind of uh, ballpark it, um, the, the sort of the casualty rate at Juneau was very comparable to what the Americans were were uh, sustaining at uh, at Omaha. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we can uh, go on to the next slide. So this is a, a quotation that I, I love to throw up from the... Uh, uh, War Diary of the Royal Winnipeg Rifles that landed at uh, Juneau Beach. In fact, they landed on the beach right in front of uh, where the, the Juneau Beach Center stands today. 
And uh, it, it is, uh, and, and I apologize for so much text. I promise this is the only slide I'll, I'll put up that has <laughs> this much text for you. I don't like doing it's, that. but It's an it important is, one, though. Well, it is. And it's, it's such a great quote because um, yeah, big time. when you're reading accounts of, of D-Day, they talk about all the, uh, the aircraft, all the bombers, all the battleships, the cruisers, the um, landing craft with rockets and uh, the idea is that they've dropped so many bombs and, and fired so many shells that uh, the hope was that uh, the infantry would be able to just to, to walk ashore and, and take possession of the ground but that wasn't the case and um, the bombardment was important um, it knocked out some positions it isolated others it cut a lot of um, communications com cables so that um, uh, forward observation officers for the Germans couldn't talk to their batteries behind the lines. That was important. But at the end of the day, the uh, success or failure of the D-Day invasion came down to the individual soldiers that were uh, pouring out of the landing craft, the, the men coming ashore in the, the duplex drive tanks. Um, it was up to their individual mm -hmm. heroism and bravery to, to storm uh, Europe and, and get the job done. It wasn't about firepower. It wasn't about brute force force. It wasn't about um, sort of overwhelming numbers. It came down to individuals willing themselves to get the job done. And uh, I love the uh, the account written by uh, Company Sergeant Major Charlie Martin, who's with the Queen's mm -hmm. Own Rifles. And he talks about landing um, in front of the well, what's today the, the Maison Queen's Own Rifles in Bernier-sur-Mer, that uh, famous house on the beach. And he said that for him, D-Day was an entirely lonely affair. He was uh, among the first Canadian troops to land on the, the coast of France. And he said that um, in his landing craft, he had, I forget the number, 30 or 35 men. But yeah. as far as he was concerned, it was him and his men alone attacking Nazi-occupied uh, Europe. That uh, on the left of him, he could just barely make out the next landing craft about mm -hmm. 100 yards away. To the right, through the, the smoke and the fog, he could just make out a, another landing craft but when that ramp came down and his men ran out onto the beach, it seemed like it was them alone against the uh, the power of uh, the Atlantic Wall. And uh, he said it was a very lonely experience. And I, I mentioned that because it's such a contrast. Here we go with uh, Saving Private Ryan again. But right. when you watch that uh, scene, that great, fantastic opening scene, you get the sense that it was a packed beach. It was jumbled. It was chaotic. It was... Um, uh, just masses of men all over the place, but that wasn't the Canadian experience. And uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, when you see a representation on, on film, that it's only going to be uh, a snapshot or a cinematic snapshot. It might not actually uh, right. realistically portray what uh, actually happened. Yeah. I was going to say it's a, I'm sorry not to interrupt you again, but I no, was going to say it's a, it's a cinematic um, fictionalized account i mean there is video like i've been looking through myself i'm gonna probably do something with it tomorrow but uh showing landing but it is from later so they were able to get more men on the beach but it does it looks like the beach is packed and also too with the saving private ryan scene when when, when the rangers are landing they're the third i think official wave uh, of landing craft so yeah it was a bit chaotic but that is not the case at Juno you know, beach there are all accounts of isolation um things like what you're mentioning here with the, the, the DD tanks being late, the engineers not getting there until later. Yeah, so there's a lot of small unit actions, people being isolated. It, it's it's just a different account, uh, or sorry, a different experience uh, than what's been popularly shown, at least from the last major, you know, D-Day movie. I mean, that set the kind of, Satan and Private Ryan set the, I don't know, in, in my generation's kind of understanding of, of D-Day. And then you have things like Longest Day coming before, which do it in an entirely different way. But anyway, uh, but yeah, again, sorry, I might just cut you off. But I think that is yeah. that's an important no, that's really kind good. of uh, aside to talk about, uh, particularly with, uh, with, with the Canadians at Juno Beach. Yeah, for sure. So if if we go to the next slide, it shows the, uh, the Anglo-Canadian beachhead as it looked on the, uh, the 6th of June. Yeah. Uh, uh, Alex, a good friend of mine, is just saying that, uh, yeah, the Canadians had urban conflict, uh, urban combat right away. The, uh, the Americans had to contend with uh, open beaches at uh, Utah and uh, bluffs, but very little urban uh, uh, buildings at uh, Omaha. But the Canadians were trying to capture a, a town, a series of towns, and they had to fight and, and winkle the Germans out of those positions. So, yeah, that's a, a very good point. This, uh, this map is showing a... Um, 
a snapshot of the Anglo-Canadian assault area on the 6th of June. Um, you can see that uh, Juno is uh, sort of in the top left part of the, the map. Um, to the Canadians left, your right is um, uh, Sword Beach. And really it's uh, Roger Beach, the one that's on the, the far uh, right of our position that is uh, where the where the British are landing. So there's quite a long gap, a uh, wide gap between uh, the Canadians who are landing at uh, saint aubin sur mer where you can see it says NSR for the North Shore Regiment. And uh, there's some British commandos that are landing just to the, uh, the left of, of the, the Canadians, but then there's a whole big wide open area where there is nobody. So uh, the mm -hmm. Canadians are, are on their own there. And then if we just uh, zoom back out, we can see that uh, uh, that first dashed arrow, which is labeled Elm, was the uh, the intermediate objective for the the Canadians on D-Day, and further south towards the bottom of the map is uh, Objective Oak, which is the uh, the Conbeyo railway line, um, the the, ra the main rail line going between the cities of Con, which is the dark area at the bottom, and uh, the city of uh, Bayeux, which is off the map to the left or or the west, mm -hmm. and that's what the Canadians were supposed to capture on on D-Day, but that didn't happen. So if we can go to the the next map. Just got a series of maps to sort of get uh, the sixth and seventh up to date. The uh, the solid um, sort of half circles show the the deepest penetrations of the, the Canadian and British troops on the uh, the sixth of June, and the uh, the circles show their objectives. Now they didn't quite get to those objectives for a, a very good reason, and even though Montgomery gets criticized for it, there's a really really good reason for it. And if we can look at the next slide. Um, at one point on the 6th of June, the uh, 21st Panzer Division mounted a, uh, a counterattack, and that's that uh, dark blue arrow coming from Caen towards Luxemer. Um, it wasn't big. Uh, we're not talking hundreds of tanks. We're talking, oh, I don't know exactly, but maybe a dozen, maybe a couple dozen. Yeah, that's what I've heard, yeah. And uh, they found uh, that seam between the Canadian and, and British beaches, and they exploited it. Um, they went all the way to the sort of the high ground, um, sort of just past uh, Douvre de la Grande, overlooking Juno to their left and, and Sword to their right, and had a look around. And they basically went, "Oh my God, what's going on?" And then turned around and went back. Didn't yeah. cause any big trouble. Didn't really uh, inflict any losses. But the notice of that counterattack um, scared the British commanders. Um, is it uh, Horrocks and? forget the commander of second British army and oh, they, oh, Dempsey Dempsey. Thank you. They yeah. made the, uh, the very rational decision to, to dig in um, mm -hmm. because as we'll see the, uh, the Canadians and the British were very good at defending against uh, German armored attacks when they were ready for them, when they were dug in, when they were prepared. Um, it was a much different deal when they uh, met them on a sort of an encounter battle where both sides are out in the open. And we've got examples of both those kind of battles that we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. But um, when the, the German armored attack was seen, the best decision the Allies could have done was to dig in and be ready to repel it. That's what they did. That's why they didn't capture Khan on D-Day. And uh, for my... Uh, my evaluation of that is that they shouldn't be criticized for that. They should be praised because uh, uh, what you're, you're dealing with is kind of a one shot deal. If you get thrown off the beaches, if you lose D-Day, um, it's going to be a long time, if ever, before you're able to, uh, to remount it. So you've got to be cautious. You have to sort of feel your way forward. You have to make rational decisions that get you um, not thrown off the beaches. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that meant that the uh, the ninth brigade was in the area of uh, villon les buissons um, seventh brigade, which is the the Regina Rifles, the Royal Winnipeg Rifles, and the, the Canadian Scottish Regiment um, are in that area of um, uh, Théon, Pierre Pont, and uh, Le Fresny Camilli in the main area. And uh, to the, the Canadians' right is the the British 69th Brigade, uh, keeping pace just south of Crewelly. All right, so on to the next slide. So if anybody had uh, tuned in to Mark Milner's wonderful uh, talk through the um, uh, Canadian Battlefields Foundation and, and uh, Laurier Military Center on, I guess it was Wednesday night, he was talking primarily about the, uh, the, the Canadian attack on the 7th of June 
that was blunted by the, uh, the counterattack. The, I don't know if it's so much a counterattack as an encounter battle by uh, 12th SS. And uh, for me, this is a really interesting battle because it's often portrayed as a Canadian defeat, a 12th SS win that the Canadians were attacking south. They encountered the Germans. The Germans uh, stopped them with prejudice and uh, threw them back. And uh, it's a, a great German victory. Um, as Mark shows, and as I completely uh, agree, I don't think it's uh, such a clear-cut victory. Um, in fact, my take on it is that it's actually a Canadian victory, that um, uh, in terms of uh, the tactical situation, it was a draw at best. And if you look at casualties, the, the, the numbers of, of men killed were roughly equivalent. Um, the Germans actually lost quite a few more tanks than the Canadians did that day. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Canadians were back up to full strength in a, a day or two. The Germans, well, what they lost, they lost, and uh, they really didn't get replaced. So uh, yeah, exactly. that's a win. And if you look at it from the uh, the operational or even strategic level, what you're seeing is uh, a clear-cut Canadian Allied victory because uh, while it was a, sort of a short check for the, the Canadians, um, it was a, a sort of a, a defeat for the Germans because they are losing their option to throw the Allied invasion back into the sea. Um, Kurt Meyer had advanced, tried to uh, stop the Canadians. He did stop them, but in the process, he uh, attrited his own forces and committed them to holding a, uh, a section of the line against further incursions. That's not what 12th SS should be doing at this point in the battle. 12th SS should not be um, holding a position in the line. They should be marshaled behind the lines, ready to strike a major significant counterattack that would threaten the entire um, Allied bridgehead. Um, because of what happened on the 7th, they weren't able to do that, and they would never be able to do that. So uh, in my mind, that's a, a clear German uh, failure at the operational level. Um, okay, now on to the next slide. So now we're getting into uh, sort of the, the meat and potatoes of our, our talk today, looking at mm -hmm. what's happening with 7th Brigade. Um, 7th Brigade had a relatively quiet 7th of June. Um, the uh, German historian uh, Hubert Meyer, who is no relation to Kurt Meyer, but he was the chief of staff of 12th SS Hitler Youth during the war. Um, in his history of 12th SS, he said that the, uh, the Canadians missed a major opportunity on the 7th of June because mm -hmm. they uh, advanced very slowly and hesitantly. And, and uh, if they'd been bolder and uh, sort of advanced uh, more quickly, they would have captured much more ground. Well, I think that's all just rubbish. Um, the Canadians were advancing quickly. Um, they had captured uh, their D-Day objective, uh, the, the Oak Line, by about noon on the 7th of June. And 7th Brigade was into the uh, the areas that they had uh, war gamed before the invasion where they planned to set up their defense. And that's uh, namely in the, the villages of uh, Breadville, Lourgailuz, uh, Puto en Besson, and for the Reginas, they pushed uh, a company south of the railway line into uh, Nore en Besson. And uh, they were prepared. They'd created their brigade fortress and uh, they were just waiting for 9th Brigade to come up to their left. Um, occupying the area of uh, Carpiquet and, and La Villeneuve, and for the, the 69th British Brigade to come up and uh, occupy the Oak Line beside them in uh, Brue and farther to the west. So everything was looking really good. But as we just heard, while 7th Brigade is taking over their uh, Brigade Fortress position, 9th Brigade was having that nasty fight that prevented them from getting forward. Um, by the end of the day, the, uh, the situation on the 9 Brigade front had stabilized. The, uh, the Germans had been stopped. The, uh, the Canadians dug in first at uh, Buron, and then they pulled back to uh, the area of uh, villon les buissons which is just to the north. You can see it sort of in the top right corner where uh, um, uh, the, the cursor is showing right now. And uh, that's where they dug in. It was uh, the best place for them to dig in. It was a higher piece of ground. It gave them good visibility. Yeah. Um, a good defensive spot, so it made sense for them to dig in. But it left uh, the, the 7th Brigade off on their own in a, in a bit of a salient. Yeah. Um, All the, the way down New, here. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, the Mew River Valley, which is that uh, area of, of, you can see the sort of the darker green forest area coming up through the center of the map. Um, the Mew River is, uh, well, it's not what we here in Canada <laughs> yeah. call a river. It's more of a creek. A, yeah, creek, creek. Uh, kind of thing that you can kind of take a, a big jump and, and step across without getting wet. But yep. it was a, a relatively deep cutting. Um, there's a mm -hmm. lot of forest. There's a lot of um, 
uh, fence lines and hedges through there. So it's um, not a substantial water obstacle, but it is an obstacle and it would have prevented most armor from uh, getting through there. So the Canadian 7th Brigade left flank was more or less protected. The uh, The right flank was a bigger problem because you can see that the uh, the British 69th Brigade hadn't made it all the way forward to the railway line. They decided for unknown reasons to uh, to dig in at uh, saint croix grand Tun, which left the uh, uh, right flank of the, uh, the Winnipeg's out in the open, so to speak. All right, moving on. All right, so the next few slides I want to show you are battlefield um, aerial reconnaissance photos that were taken sort of in the, the few weeks right after the battle was fought. So I think this one was taken on the, the 24th of June, uh, 1944. Yeah. So it is um, not right from the battle, but it is from soon after. And it's our best uh, primary source of understanding what happened by looking at the ground. So I've oriented it so that north is at the top, um, right cutting uh, right across from left to right is the uh, the Khan Bayou railway line, um, which is a substantial feature. It's not a substantial defensive feature for the most part, but there was no. an exception and we'll talk about that. Um, right in the center of the photo is uh, Puto en Besson, which would be defended by the um, Royal Winnipeg Rifles. You can see that the uh, the village is completely north of the uh, the railway line. Um, none of it extends uh, south of the railway line. Um, moving a little bit further to uh, the right, uh, the east is Breadville Lorgaleuse, which is where the Red General Rifles dug in. Um, they had one company in Breadville. They had one company in uh, Cardenville Farm, which you can see labeled there. They had one company that was further to the east at um, uh, La Villeneuve, and then they had their uh, C company south of the railway line in a little village called Norian Basson. We'll see that in a second. Um, yeah, Stu Tub was <laughs> in, uh, in Nori, and uh, he was really the, the key to the entire battle, and we'll, we'll get mm. to that in uh, in due course. And then the uh, the village of Brue, um, if you look at the 1944 maps and, and some histories that were written afterwards, you'll see the village called Brone. Um, but that was a spelling mistake that was on the 1944 map that was picked up by uh, and not corrected by some historians. But the village is Brue and it straddles the, uh, uh, the, the railway line. The uh, Winnipeg's had a company that was in there. Uh, sorry, not a company, a, a platoon that was in there north of the railway line. And there's some confusion because 12th SS said they were also in there. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think they were <laughs> south of the railway line. So, yeah, uh, I lots think of confusion both, there. Yeah, both accounts are right. There was also um, a detachment of uh, Panzerlehr Division that had got there at some point and uh, apparently got absolutely destroyed by uh, naval gunfire mm -hmm. uh, to the point where we're not quite sure how big a formation it might have been as big as a, a battalion was uh, basically wiped off the face of the earth by naval gunfire, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of impressive. Okay, next uh, next slide. So I was really lucky in about 1990, mid-90s sometime when uh, Terry Kopp and I were writing the Canadian's Guide to the Battlefields of Normandy. And uh, I went to Normandy, I rented a small airplane and I uh, did a flight uh -huh. over uh, the battlefields to get uh, photographs for the, the battlefield guide. And um, it, it's probably a story for another time, but uh, it was really neat to be able to, to get up in a small plane. We uh, uh, yeah. took off from Carpiquet Airfield. And as soon as we took off, I could see uh, all these uh, places that I'd read so much about. Um, uh, Puto obviously is almost right off the end of the runway where we uh, took off and, and that's mm -hmm. the village you can see there. This picture is taken from the north looking south, so the, the view the Canadians would have had. You can see the, the village, you can see the railway line, which is sort of about, uh, crossing the, the top uh, one third of the, the photograph. And uh, what's important is you can see the open fields beyond, um, sort of at the top third of the photograph, showing uh, basically how open that was. There would have been... Uh, very similar terrain in 1944, uh, isolated mm -hmm. trees uh, along roads, some stands of trees, some buildings. There was wheat fields that, not quite sure how deep the wheat was um, enough. Yeah. So, uh, not, not so deep that um, walking troops would be masked, but as soon as you went to ground, you would disappear into the, the wheat fields. So Yeah, that's my understanding as well from, from accounts and yeah. kind of thing. That's my, yeah, yeah. if you lay down, you were hidden, but not standing up. 
Yeah, exactly. So the, the next photo shows uh, the La Bergerie farm, which is just behind uh, Puteau. Um, this photo is looking from uh, west to east. At the top of the photo, you can just see the edge of uh, Bretville or Galeuse. Um, but this is kind of in a bit of a hollow behind um, um, Puteau. And I missed getting a photograph of it, and I wish I had it. But right about where the word uh, bergerie is, there's a, a little stand of trees, which will become absolutely crucial for um, uh, the, the battle we're going to talk about. But it's uh, just off the, the photograph taken here. Okay, next photo. Uh, that's a, a photo on the ground that I took of La Bergerie Farm. Okay, this is a, a photo that is um, taken from the, uh, the road bridge that crosses the railway uh, right on the, I guess, the western edge of, of Puteau. So the photo is looking from west to east. Um, to the left of the photo is, is Puteau en Bassin, and to the right are those open fields that we saw on the, uh, the previous air photograph. Um, the railway line is very similar to what it was in 1944. It's maybe a little bit uh, modernized, a little bit expanded, but this is the exact route. Um, Oak was, was positioned on this railway line because it was a clearly identifiable position, not because it was a defensible position. Most of the, the length of this wasn't a barrier to tanks or, or vehicles at all, except in this area right at Puteau. And there you can see that the, uh, the banks of the, the cutting are, are pretty high, mm -hmm. um, probably about 10 or 12 feet. Um, you'd get into a lot of problems if you tried to to take a tank uh, over that. You'd probably nose the, the barrel into the ground or maybe you can turn the, the turret around and go down it, but it's not a something you would uh, go through easily. But you can also see that it offers absolutely no barrier to uh, men on foot. That, no, it, it doesn't. Sorry, just to cut you, but because I, I tried myself. <laughs> I've been to these, this kind of spot. I think it was just south of uh, where we were looking last because we, we hadn't just pulled over to the side of the road or something. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It, it is crossable. I'm just, I had some trouble getting through the, the, the bush up after going up this side, but uh, yeah, that's just, I mean, that's just me. But. A lot of nettles in. Uh, yeah, they got me pretty good. Her, uh, yeah, I've learned the hard yeah, way. They're, that was about the nettles third time that the nettles got go. me. Yeah, that was about the third time they got me on that trip. So you think I'd learn, but I never did. Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> okay, and uh, okay, so the the next photo is uh, another air photo. This is showing the uh, the Regina Rifles battlefield. Um, on the the left is is Brettville. Um, sort of on the left middle is the the railway station, which is really close to uh, Cardinville Farm, and then the bottom left corner is is the edge of of Noire en Bassin. And uh, on the right is the uh, the wooded Mew River Valley, so you can get a sense of sort of how dense that terrain is. Again, I say it's not a, a barrier because of the size of the river, but it is a barrier because of the, the forest, uh, forested nature and, and sort of the, the, the depth of the, the valley would have caused problems for vehicles or tanks going through. But uh, La Villeneuve is where um, uh, one of the uh, Regina companies was first placed um, when the Regina's got there uh, around noon on the 7th of June. And the next air photo is a close up of uh, Nori en Basson. And uh, sorry, these are a little bit faded, but uh, this is uh, oriented so north is, you'd have to s uh, rotate it slightly to the right mm -hmm. so that it, north is at the top. But uh, you see uh, Nori, uh, once again, Nori is south of the. Uh, the Conveyo railway line, but it offers a really good defensive position um, on the open fields to the south of it. Uh, also the open fields to the, the southwest towards um, Le Minel Petrie, which is that sort of forested area you can see in the, the bottom left-hand corner of the, the image yet where Brad's circling right now. And uh, again, it, it's relatively open fields, um, wheat, yes, but uh, nothing that's going to um, stop you from seeing what is coming at you. Yeah. Okay. And then the next photo, this is a, a really important photograph that's taken um, on the road between um, uh, Roe, La Villeneuve, and Brettville. Um, it's the old Conveyor Highway. It's now just a, a tertiary road. Um, that's been superseded by the uh, the big highway that has been built since the end of the war. But it's on a, a little rise of land looking uh, right at the, the church steeple, which is in the, the middle of, of Brettville. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this geography is very minor. Um, it's the kind of hill that you're not even going to sort of um, uh, 
have to uh, sort of work hard to, to go up or down it. But it was absolutely crucial for uh, an engagement that was going to take place on the, uh, the 9th of June. Um, that we'll talk about in a few minutes. But essentially, this was a piece of dead ground that if you were sort of at the, the bottom of that um, little uh, valley, sort of in the distance on this road, yet where the cursor is now, um, if you were there, uh, people on the other side of this hill um, towards La Vilna wouldn't be able to see you, whether you were walking or, or whether you were in a tank. So it's what is known in, in military parlance as, as dead ground, uh, ground you can't see from a particular position. And then the, uh, the final air photograph I want to show you is of uh, the Cardenville farm. And uh, you can see this is, again, a photo looking from roughly north to south. The, uh, the big uh, industrial complex where you can see the big yellow crane, that's all post-1945 construction. That would have just been open fields um, at the time, but it is the approximate location of the, uh, the railway station, which was in there. But Cardenville Farm is that complex where the, the cursor is right now, where Brad is, is circling. And then the, uh, the village and across the top of the photograph, that's Nori en Basson. If you can see um, sort of almost dead top center of the photograph, there's a structure um, that stands out yeah, right where the cursor is. That is the, uh, the church at um, uh, Nori. And uh, it used to have a, a pointed steeple on top, but it was uh, thought to be uh, being used by the Germans as an observation point. So the, uh, the Canadians knocked it down and it was uh, never rebuilt after the war. So if you're ever on the battlefield and you see a squared off church steeple, that's a, a dead uh, giveaway that you're looking at the church at Norrie because it's the only one that looks like that. All right, so now let's get on and talk about um, the 7th Brigade battle in, in some detail. I have a, a series of maps that I'm just going to talk you through to, to, to look at the various phases of the battle because I find this works really well because there's a, well, about a dozen different phases to the, the 7th Brigade battle. Mm. And uh, if we can look at it on the maps, we can keep it all straight and understand what's going on. So again, this is going back to uh, that map we looked at before. We saw the last one was at noon on the, uh, the 7th of June. This one is now dated for uh, 2200 hours, basically last light on uh, the 7th of June. We're in um, British double daylights time, something like that. <laughs> um, but it, it's sort of the, the main part of the summer, long, long days. Very and, long days. Uh, day. It really didn't get uh, dark until about 10 o'clock at night. So mm -hmm. uh, that can be good, that can be bad, but uh, it was um, something that uh, everybody had to take into consideration. So on the right-hand side of the map, you can see again that uh, 9 Brigade is up around uh, Les Buissons. The uh, 25th Panzer Grenadier are in the Biron OT area. Um, they've got some troops that are out in the New River Valley, but not um, doing too much. Um, for the uh, the Regina Rifles, you can see they've got companies in uh, in Brettville, uh, just east of Brettville, in La Villeneuve, and in Norian-Besson. You can see the uh, Royal Winnipeg Rifles have their uh, three strongest companies along the railway line. Um, and uh, their reserve company, which is B Company, behind the village in uh, a little wood. Um, it's important to say that there wasn't any Canadian troops in Puto itself during the battle. Um, the, 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 the buildings were very strongly built, stone buildings. They would have offered mm -hmm. great protection against uh, rifle or, or shell fire, but you had absolutely no visibility in that. So the, uh, the three companies, I think it was a in Brue C, south of Puto, and D Company, which is uh, just um, to the uh, the east of Puto, were the uh, the strongest uh, companies. B Company was um, the company on D-Day that had got hammered really hard. It mm. was uh, the company that had landed right beside the, the Sul River and had taken the vast majority of uh, the, the Winnipeg's casualties, almost uh, 100 casualties out of about 120 casualties the, the regiment took on D-Day. Um, it had got a, a big draft of reinforcements late on D-Day, but it was still under strength. And obviously with reinforcements, it takes a little bit of time to integrate them. So it was uh, the weakest company and that's the why it was uh, put into reserve. You can see the uh, Canadian Scottish Regiment is uh, north of the, uh, the brigade position at uh, Secville-en-Besson. 
um, it's in reserve and it's providing a contingency should anything happen. Now the uh, the Seventh Brigade Commander uh, Brigadier Foster is aware of the challenges of his situation. He knows what happened to uh, Seven Brigade, sorry, to Nine Brigade. So he has put a screening force along the Mew River Valley, and you can see that dotted line is showing that. There's a, a company of the Canadian Scottish. There's a um, detachment of um, First Hazard's tanks. There are some uh, machine gun and mortar troops from the, uh, the Camerons of, of uh, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, Camerons of Canada. No, Camerons of Ottawa. Camerons oh. of Ottawa. <laughs> uh, there's two uh, Cameron regiments in the Canadian. Yes, regiment. yes, there is. It was the Ottawa. Yeah, Ottawa yes, one. it was the Ottawa. One. So those are um, stationed along the, the Mew River Valley just to screen and, and basically to provide a, a tripwire in case the Germans decided to do something. Um, the other thing that he did, which ended up being uh, the absolute game changer, was uh, you can see that little circle just to the, the top left of the uh, La Bergerie farm, a little dot, a dash circle. Um, that is that little farm that is uh, right near La Bergerie farm. And uh, he knew that 69 Brigade hadn't made it down to uh, Oak Line, that it was back in uh, San Croix. And that left uh, the, the entire right flank of the, the Winnipeg's wide open. So he put a, a small little force in, uh, in that wood. There were um, some anti-tank guns from 3rd Anti-Tank Regiment, um, some uh, bigger anti-tank guns, 17-pounders from the, the British 62nd Anti-Tank Regiment. There was a, a platoon of mortars and a platoon of uh, medium machine guns, Vickers guns from the, the Camerons. And uh, I believe there were some engineers there as well. And they were there to sort of protect that uh, open flank. Um, they weren't able to occupy it, but they were able to uh, to cover it with fire. Um, going back to that old uh, the Bell Canada commercial, uh, reach out and touch somebody um, was the, the idea there that uh, you don't have to hold it, but you can control it. Yeah. So this was the, the situation. Um, to the south was the uh, the 26th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Now this is uh, the equivalent of a Canadian brigade. So there's uh, three infantry battalions. Um, there's a pioneer engineer battalion. Um, there are uh, tank uh, forces as well. Um, but this is uh, Wilhelm Monka's um, uh, unit. And uh, it's arriving at the battlefield piecemeal. Um, mm -hmm. slowly arriving and basically being thrown into the line as they arrive and uh, really not taking much time for reconnaissance or preparation or gathering forces to uh, to launch a major attack but they start making probing attacks um, basically as soon as night falls on the, uh, the 7th of June. So next map. So now we're at about three o'clock in the morning on the 8th of June and you can see some uh, bigger arrows. The uh, the Germans have identified that there's a Canadian position at norient besson and uh, decide to uh, to take that out quickly. Um, they launch a, sort of an uncoordinated attack at night, and it's largely stonked by uh, Canadian artillery. The Canadians see it coming. They call for artillery. Um, the uh, the first and third companies don't get very close. The uh, second company manages to bypass Nori and, and get into the area of Cardenville Farm. There's no Canadians there yet. Um, they get there. Um, they realize there's nobody there. They realize they're by themselves. So they basically say, yeah, you know what? This isn't good. We're leaving. So they left, and it left the uh, the situation uh, basically where it was. Um, there's also some, there's still some desultory attacks or probes at uh, Puto uh, going on all night. Um, the Canadians are also trying to uh, to um, prepare their position. They send out a party of uh, Winnipeg's and engineers to uh, lay a series of mines in the open field south of the uh, um, south of the railway line. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, the party isn't well enough protected, and uh, a German patrol stumbles onto them and, and scatters them. There's uh, three uh, three Canadians. Um, two engineers from uh, six field company, six field regiment and uh, a Winnipeg that are forced to go on the run. Um, they're on the run for about 72 hours um, before they're finally captured. And uh, they're subsequently taken back to uh, Wilhelm Monkey's uh, headquarters, interrogated by him and then uh, executed in, uh, in cold blood on the, uh, the 11th of June. And unfortunately that's not the only time we're going to hear about that sad story. Mm -hmm. All right, next slide, please. So now we're uh, early morning, uh, the sun is up 
in Normandy on the 8th of June, and things are starting to get real for the, the Winnipegs. The uh, 26th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, it's their uh, 2nd Battalion, is starting to make some serious probes at uh, the Winnipegs in, in Puto. Their, um, I believe it's their 3rd Battalion goes in and, and takes Brue in strength, finding nobody there um, south of the railway line and, and really don't play a big part in uh, what's to come, although I think they do send a, a company or more into the uh, the Puto battle. Um, Meldrum, who is the, the Canadian battalion commander, the commander of the, the Winnipegs, is aware of what's going on, but he's not at all worried. He's calling down artillery. He's moving around the battlefield, first in um, a Bren gun carrier, later on foot. Um, it's getting hot, but nothing is uh, worrying him or, or stopping him from moving around. And the Canadians are... Uh, preventing the, the Germans from doing what they want. Uh, moving on to the, the next slide. Oh, can um, I just stop you real quick, actually, because we had a question from Alex. Um, hold on here. I think I know the answer, but I do want to talk about it just real briefly. Um, about Was there any provision for air support during the battle? Air support? Alex, <laughs> you must be crazy. <laughs> there is absolutely no... Um, no ability for the army to talk to the uh, the air force on the battlefield at, at this point in, in the battle. Um, there's no forward air controllers that are, are with the, uh, the the troops at the front. Um, and I mean, we've had this talk before, uh, you know it as well as I do. The air force is really good at hitting targets of their own choice beyond the battlefield, mm -hmm. armed reconnaissance, uh, finding targets of opportunity. Um, they are really, really bad at providing the kind of support that the, uh, the army wants for them on the battlefield. They can't find tanks, they can't find artillery, they can't find troops. They're as likely to bomb their own troops as the enemy troops, and there's just absolutely zero ability to provide close air support in a battle of this nature pretty much for the entire war, um, though there are occasions where um, air support does uh, play a, a closer role, but no, there's there's no way to, to control it at all. So Not at this level. That. That's a good question, and I'm sure one that lots of people had out there. Yeah. Air power is important, but it's not doing what the Army wanted it to do. And again, that's a topic for a whole other show. Yeah, that could fill many volumes and do many shows. So sorry, this is 6.30. Do you want me to go forward? Yeah, yeah, we can go to noon. I think the next show is, yeah, this is showing the uh, the situation from about uh, 9.30 in the morning until 1700. Um, the Germans just kept um, going into this battle, flowing into it. It wasn't one major attack. It was a series of smaller attacks, infiltration attacks. Um, John English, again, I come back to him, is very dismissive of this. He says that the uh, the Winnipegs were, were put to flight by a force that was the, the exact same size as them. In fact, I think he says it was three companies of 12th SS, um, giving the idea that the Canadians were uh, um, put to flight by a, a smaller force attacking mm -hmm. them. That's um, absolute uh, crap. Um, to, to put it mildly, um, the, uh, the 12th SS had big companies, um, anywhere from 150 to, to 200 men each. Um, they also mm -hmm. had a fourth heavy weapons company that would have been involved in the battle. They also would have had um, support from the 3rd Battalion that was in, in Brue that would have been. So, uh, yeah, it's quite uh, safe to say that the Canadians were outnumbered in this battle. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, they were, they were over strength as well, if I'm remembering. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, company, and the other the part that uh, English is very dismissive about is he said that uh, everybody says that there was armor in this battle, that the Germans had uh, armored support, but it's quite clear that they had no tanks. Um, and again, I'll, I'll say, no, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, he English might be right in the sense that there wasn't um, German tanks, so mm -hmm. not Mark IVs, not Panthers um, involved in the battle, but there were fighting vehicle, armored fighting vehicles, for sure. Maybe they were uh, tank destroyers. Maybe they were Stugs. Maybe they were uh, Panzer III's. Um, but they were armor. And as far as the infantry was concerned, a tank is a tank is a tank. And uh, a Stug is going to ruin your day just as much as a, a Mark IV or a Panther in a, a battle like this. So, yeah, there was uh, as many as 15 or 20 uh, German armored vehicles that were uh, involved, not to mention... Uh, 
armored half tracks that would have been uh, involved in the battle as well. So mm. by uh, about noon, uh, Meldrum was getting concerned about his situation, but when he talked to Brigade, he uh, he thought he had uh, things on, in hand. He wasn't worried about getting pushed out. Um, he was finding things hotter that he couldn't move around the battlefield with quite as much uh, freedom. Um, he eventually trans uh, transferred his command to a, um, uh, a Sherman uh, uh, artillery foos tank, which is a a Sherman that uh, didn't have an actual uh, 75 millimeter gun in it because it was all replaced with radios, but it was fully armored and allowed him to, to move about the battlefield again. Um, at some point, the uh, A Company in Bruay and C Company south of uh, Bruay were, oh, sorry, south of Puteaux were overrun. Um, the Germans infiltrated through and beyond their positions. Um, some men worked their way back to uh, where the, the B Company was behind the town, or where D Company was um, to the right uh, on our map or to the, the east um, and uh, sort of found uh, safe haven there. Um, but uh, I, I think it's also really important to say that at no point did the Winnipeg's break and run um, during this battle. Yes, mm -hmm. they had two companies overrun, um, but even the men that uh, sort of found themselves behind the lines continued fighting, um, continued resisting, continued trying to find a way to uh, escape and evade but nobody broke and run. There was no panic. There was no uh, sort of screw this, we're out of here kind of thing. They were always doing what they could to, to save the situation. And that's that's really key, and we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, D Company, um, which was to the uh, the east of, of Puto, was never displaced from its position. Um, it was never, um, it, it, it had a much better position in that it was not um, sort of closer to the built-up area of Puto, it was more in the open. So they had uh, more space to control the area in front of them with fire and uh, keep the Germans from overrunning their position. As well, B Company was threatened, but it was never overrun. And while the Germans uh, infiltrated into the area behind uh, in between Brue and Puto, they never uh, overran uh, B Company. The, uh, the Canadians were fortuitous at one point um, in the sense that uh, at one point when it looked like the... Um, uh, that you can see the the arrow from the on the extreme left is looking to outflank and, and surround uh, Puto. Um, just as the the Germans were advancing and looking to do that, a uh, reconnaissance uh, element from the 24th Lancers, a uh, Sherman tank uh, battalion from uh, the British, uh, happened onto the battlefield, and they had no knowledge of what was going on. What they were doing was. Um, they had been told to go to Puteau and make a sharp left, and they were to advance south um, as part of uh, what their objective was, but they just sort of happened on to this battle. They liaised with, um, I'm forgetting his name, but the commander of, of A Company and uh, launched a concerted attack, which stopped the, uh, the German uh, attack in its tracks. The other thing that prevented uh, Puteau from being surrounded and, and isolated was that uh, battle group that was uh, in the wood north of La Bergerie Farm. Um, it was taking uh, some very heavy fire. The Germans identified early on that there was a Canadian battle group in there and they uh, directed machine gun tank and artillery fire at it. Um, they knocked out a couple of the uh, third anti-tank, uh, six pounder anti-tank guns, but uh, those were quickly replaced and uh, they were reinforced by um, 17 pounders, I think towed, but maybe a couple of uh, M10 17 pounders as well. And uh, mm -hmm. that position was absolutely crucial and uh, never gave up, never stopped firing. The machine guns and mortars there were absolutely crucial in uh, protecting the Winnipegs and uh, preventing them from being uh, surrounded and isolated. So uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, they didn't break and run was absolutely crucial because um, Brigadier Foster, who's with the Canadian Scottish back in Secville, is trying to figure out what to do. And uh, the, the Canadian Scottish were the only uh, formed infantry battalion between the uh, um, 12th SS and the beaches. And uh, if the, uh, the Winnipeg's broke and run, they would have to dig in at Secville and prepare to uh, uh, keep defending and make sure the Germans didn't get any farther. But because the Winnipeg's didn't break, because they didn't run, because they held on, um, it gave Foster the time to make use of the Canadian Scottish not as a defensive battalion, but to throw them into the fight in an offensive capacity to uh, win back uh, Puto. And that's exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. So we'll go on to the, uh, the next slide. So 
by about uh, 1830, uh, 630 in the evening, the situation at Puto had, had stabilized. Um, uh, Brig um, Lieutenant Colonel Cabaldew, the commander of the Canadian Scottish, was given a warning order saying, be prepared to, uh, to launch a, a counterattack to uh, recapture Puto. And he had about two hours to, uh, to put together this hasty attack to uh, uh, bring in other forces that would be supporting him. He had a uh, ad hoc company from uh, the first Hazars. He had uh, uh, anti-tank guns, uh, M10 anti-tank guns from the 62nd Anti-Tank Regiment, the British unit that was supporting him. He had uh, all four of his companies that were going into the attack, including one of his companies that had been over in the Mew River Valley that had been told about this. They had to do uh, an eight kilometer long forced march. They arrived just in time to uh, get a, a quick briefing and then they uh, carried on into the attack, which was launched at uh, uh, 8.30, 2030 hours, uh, about two hours before last light. Um, the uh, Canadians didn't know where the, the remnants of the, the Winnipegs were. So sort of from the start line right to the edge of, of Puteau, they just used smoke um, to cover their advance for about the first 15 minutes. The uh, uh, Canadians' uh, attack went uh, undetected. Um, then they uh, were seen, and uh, the Germans responded with a fury, machine guns, mortars, artillery. Um, Canadians took, uh, the Canadian Scottish took quite a, a heavy toll, about 50 men. 45 men were, were killed in the assault, but they never slowed down. They never stopped. And uh, in less than an hour from when they uh, crossed their start line, they had uh, thrown all of the 12th SS out of Puto and recaptured it and set about digging in to uh, defend it. And from that point on, the uh, 12th SS would never uh, hold Puto again. They would never uh, get back into that position. All right, I think... What's the next map? Okay, if you want to go back for a second. So I, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's worth repeating that the, the Winnipegs didn't break and run. They held on, they yeah. uh, fought, and gave the Canadian uh, 7th Brigade Commander Foster a chance to rescue the situation. If they had broken and run, it would have been a totally different um, situation. The Canadians wouldn't have been able to attack back and, and recapture uh, Puto. It just wouldn't have happened. They would have had to keep digging on. But because they uh, they fought on, because they kept going, it was a completely different situation. I, I say this because I don't want to, um, I, I can't sell this as a, a Canadian victory. It's not a Canadian victory, but it's not a Canadian defeat as well, especially not in the way that uh, English and others uh, talk about. Um, if anything, it's a German defeat because they captured it and they lost it again in the same day. And for them, the loss is a much bigger uh, deal than the, the temporary setback experienced by the Canadians. Um, losses are, are tough to, to calculate. For the Canadians, we're, we're very uh, sure that the Winnipeg's lost about 100 men killed, uh, give or take. But it's important to say that only about half of those were killed during the battle. Um, the other half were men that were captured by the uh, yeah. 12th SS, taken prisoner, uh, disarmed, marched behind the lines, and subsequently executed, um, which is a, an absolutely terrible story. Um, the Canadian Scottish took another 45 fatal casualties in in uh, capturing, uh, recapturing Puto. So it was a, a costly battle, but ultimately a successful one. The uh, the German casualties are much more difficult to uh, to talk about. Um, Hubert Meyer says the uh, Germans only sustained about 18 killed on the, uh, the 8th of June. I think that's absolutely yeah. wrong. There's no way they took that few casualties. No, um, right. we, we know that um, the, the, the British uh, tank regiment, the 24th Lancers, captured somewhere between 40 and 70 Germans and uh, took them behind the lines. Um, again, we can say uh, quite uh, surely that those prisoners made it back and went on to live long lives, unlike the, the Canadians who were, were captured for the battle. So uh, yeah, that makes a, uh, a big difference. But uh, yeah, again, the German, this was a bigger German defeat than the, the tactical loss they suffered. Uh, what they're trying to do is to eliminate the Canadian bridgehead, the Allied bridgehead in Normandy. And the only way they can do that is by pushing through this Canadian position. Um, they didn't want to... Um, uh, the Battle of Puto was just a means to an end. They wanted to capture those positions as a staging ground for their core level offensive 
but they were able, never able to do that. And as a result, they ultimately lost in, in Normandy. So we'll go on. We'll uh, I see we spend a fair bit of time on this, but I'll go through the, uh, the Regina's battle as well, um, because it's a really instructive battle in, in, in addition. Um, Michael Reynolds, who is a uh, <coughs> British historian, uh, ex-army, I think he was a brigadier in the British Army, um, but he's also got a, a bit of a, an excess love for all things Nazi, which I have a problem with. Um, but he calls the uh, Regina's uh, uh, stand in, in Brettville one of the, the greatest small unit actions in the entire Second World War. Um, this is the, uh, the first time that... Uh, Kurt Meyer is back into the fight after his check against the uh, Canadian 9th Brigade on the 7th. And he's using all his experience from the Eastern Front, um, thinking that uh, all he needs is shock and awe. I know that's not the, the appropriate term, but uh, that when uh, he applied shock and awe to the Russians, they would crumble and run and leave him in uh, control of the battlefield. And he thought he just had to basically show up with, with his Panthers and do the same thing to the Canadians. But again, these uh, little fish had big teeth and that wasn't uh, going to happen. So um, yeah. just as the, uh, the Canadian Scottish attack was going in on, on Puteaux, the uh, uh, Panther forces of uh, Kurt Meyer were making an attack against uh, Brettville and he had a, a Panther company. He had a, uh, uh, some infantry, though not anywhere near enough infantry, and uh, some mobile artillery. And he thought he could just go up the uh, the main Conway Highway, sort of over that road that we just saw in uh, the other photo a few slides earlier, and uh, go right into uh, to Brettville and, and send the, the Canadians running. Well, problem with using armor in a, an urban environment is that if you don't have uh, infantry support, you're going to have a lot of problems. And uh, to say Meyer had a lot of problems is to, to put it mildly. His uh, Panthers yeah. were able to uh, to get into Brettville no problem, but instead of running, the uh, the Reginas just went to ground and uh, brought out the Piets. Uh, bring yeah. up the Piet. Uh, yeah. It was probably <laughs> called uh, many times during oh, that many battle. Times. And uh, <clears throat> during the course of the night, the, uh, the Reginas accounted for about seven Panther tanks knocked out. Um, the Germans were, were just frustrated. They couldn't do anything. They shot up the town. I'll show you some photos a little bit later at the damage they caused, but yeah. the Canadians just went to ground and uh, armor without infantry in a, a village can't do anything. And as uh, dawn began to break, uh, Meyer really realized he couldn't do anything and he had to uh, to pull his troops back and leave the Canadians in Brettville. Um, he'd also sent uh, another uh, Panther force to Cardenville Farm where uh, C Company of the Reginas was. Again, part of it was overrun, but the, uh, the Panthers couldn't do anything to the Canadians there. They just held on and when day broke or as day was uh, approaching, they had to, to move on and, and left the uh, Canadians in possession of, of the village. This was the, the first of four aborted German attacks on, uh, on the Reginas over the next uh, 24 hours. So next slide. So Meyer reevaluated the battlefield and, and uh, looked at the uh, position of, uh, sorry, it's C Company, D Company was in Curtinville Farm, um, C Company in, in Norrie, and uh, said this was the key to the uh, the battlefield. We can't take Brettville until we take Nori. So he was going to launch uh, another uh, armored spearhead at it. And so he uh, uh, marshaled his forces in in row. They went south through row. You can see the arrow, the blue arrow in the middle. Uh, they went underneath the railway line at uh, La Villeneuve. They continued on, uh, crossed, uh, sorry, went under the, the railway line and then turned to their right and uh, attacked uh, Nori head on, thinking that their shock would again send the Canadians running. Well, again, fortune favored the, the Canadians in this battle, and uh, that little bit of dead ground that I showed you came into play at this point because there was a small detachment of uh, First Azar's tanks that had been uh, moving across that piece of dead ground, passing Brettville on their way to reinforcing the Canadians in Nori. And it just so happened they were in that dead ground when. Um, the, uh, the attack went across and they saw their dream target. Here was a uh, force of uh, Panthers, about 12, 14 Panthers that were going. Yeah. Um, they were less than a thousand yards away. They uh, were showing their side armor. They didn't know they were there. And uh, this armored force had uh, at least two fireflies, one commanded by uh, Lieutenant Gordon Henry of the, uh, the first Hazars. And uh, uh, Lieutenant Henry ordered his uh, crew to start firing. One shot, one panther. Two shots, two panthers. 
he uh, accounted for four Panthers. Uh, another firefly took out uh, two more Panthers, and there was a seventh Panther that was destroyed in the battle. And uh, the Germans didn't know what happened. In uh, a matter of uh, a couple minutes, their uh, grand armored force had been uh, destroyed. The, uh, the accounts from the Germans are, are kind of funny because they thought they'd hit mines and they thought yeah. they'd run into a minefield. Well, yeah, no, they had no idea what was happening. Well, yeah, yeah, sorry. All of a sudden, I've heard. Yeah, I read too. All of a sudden, just the turrets are blowing off tanks, and they have yeah. no idea where that's how that's even happening. Yeah, they had uh, no ability to uh, to deal with the uh, the Canadian Germans, and they had to turn around uh, the ones that weren't knocked out and and uh, run away essentially, and uh, they yep. didn't get anywhere near uh, Norrie. So, uh, an amazing battle. Um, uh, Lieutenant Henry, um, I can't believe he wasn't awarded the Victoria Cross for that battle. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing that, no accommodations at all. Rick, no, nothing. well, he, he ended up getting a uh, a French award later that was later, but more nothing from for not yeah. particularly, but for his entire uh, sort yeah. of war experience. And uh, his uh, commanding officer was it the brigade commander was asked why this didn't happen, and he said, yeah. "Why should he get a medal? He was just doing his job." Mm -hmm. okay well i guess he's not wrong but uh yeah we'll but i mean it's a crazy. little yeah <laughs> anyway so anyway the uh this attack was supposed to be supported by a uh, another german attack coming from sam manview at the bottom at nori but it never materialized or it may have materialized and was absolutely destroyed by uh artillery fire but regardless it didn't play any role in this so the uh the germans weren't done yet um go on to the next slide they, uh, on the, the 10th of June, they thought, well, we've still got our pioneer battalion, our engineers that haven't been committed. So why don't we throw them at uh, Nori? So they uh, kicked off an attack in daylight at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning on the 10th of June. And uh, the Canadian uh, foos saw them coming. And again, this one was absolutely definitely destroyed in the fields before ever getting close to, uh, to Nori. And what I find uh, most interesting about this particular engagement is that if you go and uh, read the uh, uh, Regina's War Diary for that day, it says uh, nothing much was happening this morning. <laughs> yeah. <Yep. laughs> um, whereas, uh, well, we've just destroyed their pioneer battalion, but nothing much was happening. Mm -hmm. um, it was just what artillery does. So the, uh, yeah, the Germans just kept throwing these left and right hooks that yeah. were not landing. They were failing and it was badly coordinated. It was badly controlled. It was badly commanded and uh, had absolutely no success. Um, yeah. Battles. Sorry. Yeah. Just, to, I, I, I don't know if these attacks are bravado or stupidity. I'm leaning towards, well, both, but more stupidity. I mean, it's just like, oh, that'll work. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah sure, it's, it's fine. <laughs> I, I think part of it is they 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 didn't think much of the Canadians. Like, yeah. They, they keep coming back to Little Fish. Um, they knew their experience with the Russians, that you throw an armored counterattack against them and they just drop their guns and, and run away. Well, that wasn't what was happening here. I also don't think they respected uh, Allied artillery enough at this point and knew what it could do. do. Uh, we haven't really talked about that much. Uh, Mark Milner's written a brilliant article on Canadian military history on the uh, the artillery side of, of this battle, which I, I really uh, suggest you go and look at, but uh, 12th and uh, 13th field were directly supporting the uh, Canadian 7th Brigade, but uh, there was also um, uh, 14th field and 19th field and the medium guns that could all be called in to, uh, to support at this point and uh, made, a, made a big difference and yeah, major difference on what was going on. So. So yeah, so let's. Uh, I think I, I've just got some slides that show some photographs. Of, yeah, of the this, these are really interesting. So yeah, um, we're gonna. I know we're a bit over usually what I normally do, but I do want to show these. So if you guys just yeah, want to stick around so, for a little bit, we'll start to wrap up. But these are are are, are brilliant photos. Yeah. So on the on the left is a, a mortar platoon from the Reginas, um, just showing sort of what their field works would look at. On uh, the right, I think this is. Uh, D company in, in yep. Cardinville, but I'm not sure. It is. But it, it gives you an idea of the stone buildings. They would have uh, created a, yep. uh, a weapons port and they could look through it and, and fire through it and it gave them a lot of protection. And basically when the, the Panthers showed up on the other side of the wall, they were just quiet and nobody could do anything about them. So Yeah, and just blasted it well. And too, I think we, yeah, we didn't talk about that, but just again, that leads to my earlier question about the stupidity and bravado of the 12th SS attack yeah, at sure. Cardinville. They're just writing on the armor and then they're just getting blown away before they even know what's happening. I mean, again, it's just, 
I know, again, I heard this 12th SS stuff, but I mean, again, like I can't get past the murders. And then again, the battlefield stupidity or bravado or yeah. deadly mix of it. I know, sorry, I just, it just- yeah, it, No, no, it's, it, it's all those things combined. It was uh, yeah. just purely, poorly thought out. But there's also, there's also an issue with offensive operations in Normandy where the, the defender has yeah. a lot of advantages that um, yeah. the attack has to be done by somebody coming out into the open ground and exposing themselves. Yeah. And if the defenders are prepared, that's going to be a, a very costly uh, experience. And uh, here it was uh, 12th SS that was made to pay the price. For most of the rest of the Normandy campaign, it was the allies that were paying that price. And yeah. usually um, artillery and, and sometimes air power would uh, um, even the, the odds and, and make it possible that even though you took heavy casualties, you could get on what you wanted. Um, I'm doing a talk with uh, World War II TV yeah. on the uh, the 11th of June, talking about Luminal Petri, and that's a, a complete reversal of this situation. Yeah. Canadians um, try to do this kind of a hasty attack, the first Tsars and Queen own, Queen's own rifles, and uh, they experience the same thing that uh, Myers tanks and infantry did. So uh, yeah. the, the problem is attacking. And uh, yeah. that's again something to, to talk about. For another yeah. Day. So uh, yeah, everyone, I put a link to that. It's coming up on the 11th, right? Yeah. So yeah, check that out. So yeah, so you can check that out. So yeah, I don't want to spend more time. Um, this is the uh, you can see the, the church steeple just in the the center of that photo. This is uh, a couple of trucks from the Reginas that uh, were just off the main street and it shows the damage that was caused by Myers tanks during that night attack. There's two, I think there's a third tank uh, truck just off to the left, but uh, these were burnt out, uh, the buildings were burnt out, but again, he couldn't hold on to the ground. Um, this is that famous shot of, of one of the Panther tanks that was destroyed on the, the main street in, uh, in Brettville. It's the first uh, in Normandy, isn't it? Sorry? Is the first one destroyed in Normandy, I believe. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a that, it's very it's claimed anyway. Case. Yeah, um, anyway. I hadn't heard that claim, but it makes sense. I'm not sure it's the kind of thing you could actually yeah. prove. No, I don't think you can. But, uh, <laughs> there was lots of, uh, people, lots of higher ups came and looked at it. I know that because I've seen the photos. Yeah, so, well, uh, it's very famous. I think. I think. Yeah. I think. Um, Third Annie Tank had a, a couple of guns at the entrance to Brettville. It might have destroyed one of the Panther tanks before yeah. it got into the village. So but maybe that has a better claim. But this was certainly the first uh, major uh, battle that the Allies fought against Panthers. And yeah. well, yeah. the Panther was found wanting. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and everybody likes the sort of now and then photo. So we go on to the next one and we can see uh, this, this building is still in Brettville. It's almost directly across from the church. And uh, you can see sort of where the well, where the wall was destroyed, and where the original 1944 wall is still there, and that's where that tank had sat uh, when yeah. it was destroyed on the night of uh, the 8th of June. Yeah, and when I was there, there's a plaque up with this photo at the top here. Yeah. Um, oh, there now. Kind of, yeah, across the street. I think it's. I'm not sure what it is now, but it's a larger building, directly across the street from where the the, the Piot was launched. All right, and there's that uh, church steeple that was uh, destroyed during the fighting. Um, again, this was probably destroyed by the Germans, thinking mm -hmm. Canadians had foos up there, um, but uh, it was standard procedure to, to knock down the church steeples because they, they offered a threat. So here's a 1944 photo on how the church looks today. And then this is a really fascinating air photograph that I found. It's I think you've seen this one already. It's part of the, the earlier... Uh, display I did, but uh, this one is is absolutely fantastic because at one point I decided to look a little more closely at what's in it. So Brettville is at the top, um, the Combay uh, railway line bisects the middle, Nori is at the bottom. And uh, Brad, if you want to click, uh, you can see exactly where the... Uh, where do you want me to go? Uh, I think if you just click to the next slide. Oh, to the next, yeah, sorry, hold on. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll oh, yeah, zoom here, in, yeah. and there's the slice, and uh, you can just keep hitting the space bar. Um, those little dots that you see there are the uh, the German Panther tanks. One, two, three, four, five, six of the uh, the seven are uh, overzealous. <laughs> skipping ahead, showing the uh, yeah, those yeah. are the, the hulks of the uh, the Panther tanks that were destroyed by Lieutenant Henry and and uh, his men uh, on the ninth. So that's yep. uh, that's kind of neat to see, and then. After the battle, these tanks kind of became a, a tourist uh, spot. Um, going on to the next photograph, 
Um, you can see they're absolutely riddled with uh, shell holes. This wasn't what uh, uh, Lieutenant Henry did. He was one shot, one kill for the most part. But uh, as uh, armored units went through this area, they like to put a shot or two into them just to, yeah. to test their accuracy and test everything like that. So yeah, they you, like to do that. And I'll yeah, exactly. So this is, this is a photo that was taken later in I think July. And uh, go yeah, to the next on. slide. Oh, sorry. There's this one. This is. Uh, this is Lieutenant Henry, and uh, funny story, I'd been looking for a photo of him for a long time, was really frustrated because I thought, here's this great Canadian hero, he wasn't uh, given an award, but we can't even put a face to his name, and um, before the uh, the 75th anniversary um, celebrations for uh, the, the D-Day landings in, in 19, uh, sorry, 2019, I, I gave a briefing to uh, the CTV news team that was going to be over in France. And uh, I gave them a lot of this story and I, I mentioned to them about Lieutenant Henry. And then I said, oh, I'd give anything to be able to find a photograph of him, but I've never been able mm. to, to track one down. And about a week later, one of their uh, interns sent me an email and, and she said, hey, is this the guy? And I said, yes, it is. And <laughs> they found his photograph in, a, I think it's a Montreal newspaper um, from later in the summer. So uh, yeah, we uh, we have a photo of him. I don't think the uh, First Desires Museum in London even has the the photo so uh yeah as far as i know they don't yeah absolutely thrilled so he survived the war um which is yep. is pretty amazing um his tank which was known as the comtesse de feu was uh survived the battle um survived until the the fighting around Caen. um he was then pulled out and given a new position uh, and in the next battle his tank was destroyed without him so uh, yeah, yeah. That, that tank didn't survive but he did which is good yes yeah, one of them are like again because again i have the hometown connection sorry as a quick aside here to the first azars because i'm from london ontario myself so i get a little get a little excited by this story just because the london units don't get too much attention and this one is just a story i think mark miller says a, always says that if they were an american if he was an american this would have had a movie a long time ago well uh, I, I, yeah i think that's the story of um the entire seventh brigade battle if it was yeah. british or american there would be uh, books written about it there'd be movies there'd be poems there'd be songs uh, everybody would know about it but because it was the canadians it's like oh yeah they're just doing their job and, yeah, nobody knows about it. So I'm trying to change that slowly, but uh, surely. Yeah, I mean, lots of us, I try to do what I can. You're doing lots of great stuff with this. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's difficult. And then again, things, again, I've talked about this, the, this Canadian focus on defeat or whatever it is, because like Lemons and L gets so much attention. And because of, I don't know what I would outright say is this kind of, you know, that fanboyness of the SS. And uh, I think Mark Milner said this too, love of all things Panzer and all that kind of thing. So anyway, sorry, I'm digressing here. But, hey, good uh, thing, everyone. Uh, really so uh, get feedback here. Uh, is there more, one more slide or is that the last? Uh, I think there, yeah, I think I've got a couple more pictures of. Yeah, the knocked out. Yeah, tanks. that's uh, another picture of that same tank. You can see it all chewed up. And then uh, I think there's just one more photo and it shows that tank from a different perspective. But what I like about it is in the background, you can see two of the other panels. Yeah, two more. There. Yeah, in the back there. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, so, so yeah, if you want to just kind of wrap up here. We can yeah, so the, the Normandy campaign was 77 days. Um, that's the way I've always tracked it. Um, that's sort of from D-Day until the, the closing of the Plez Gap. Mm -hmm. um, the French like to talk about the 100 days of Normandy. Um, because mm -hmm. for them, the fighting and killing didn't stop until the sort of the fighting went beyond the Seine River. So they like to talk about the 100 days. So I just throw that up there because there's different ways of looking at these things. Yep. Um, if, if we talk about the, the Normandy victory, um, it's often compared to Stalingrad and, and talked about being a, an incomplete victory because of the uh, the escape of German forces from the, the Flez pocket. And I, I, I think that's really beside the point. We have two entire German armies destroyed, uh, half a million men lost, 37 combat uh, divisions um, destroyed, plus another six that have to be left behind as, as uh, port garrisons. And then there's another uh, 25,000 men that are captured near Mons on the 4th of September. So Normandy is a, a huge, important victory in, in every way, shape and form. And the idea that it was uh, incomplete is, uh, is, is problematic. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I completely agree. Mike. Yeah. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, yeah, it's the uh, same for me. I mean, I was there in 
2016 and it's just great to see and, yeah, and see, I'll, I'll like, myself and i'll say that i was on the very first <laughs> yes, uh, you were. canadian battle of normandy <laughs> foundation as it was at the time yeah. in 1995 yeah um, so that's yeah that's going way back yeah i was seven years old at the time so <laughs> <laughs> not to make you feel old or anything like but uh yeah so no, anyway yeah, so the, these like yeah like i was talking on the mark milner uh talk uh, the other day and as i always say the tours make a huge difference. I mean, and they show us, like obviously I already knew all of this, but not everybody does. And this is the great way to show this, trying to change kind of that perceptions that we have of Normandy, all the other things that uh, have gone on. I mean, we do have to talk um, about the defeats. I mean, that's unavoidable. That's not what I claim ever. Um, like what you're gonna do with on the 11th there, I think is great. I mean, it's it sucks to hear as a Canadian and as someone who, knows the first is our story and what they were able to do before that it's just unfortunate that, that often gets a lot of the focus and gets brought up no matter what's being discussed yeah. that's happened to me a few times and it's just no, it's unfortunate I, I agree and I, I don't think we can talk about the success of seventh brigade without talking about the failure at uh, liminal patrie because it's all part of the same um the same yeah. sort of fabric and those who pull liminal patrie out and use it as a, an illustration of canadian failure often won't we'll talk about what happened with the seven yeah. brigade and their success. So it, it all has to be balanced out and we have to yeah. talk about it all and we have to understand it all. And uh, we can't just sort of talk about the, the good news stories. We have to talk about the bad news ones as well. And, and that's, uh, that's really important. Yeah. And just understanding the context, sorry, excuse me, is, is huge. Like you did at the beginning of this and kind of moving forward. Yeah. It just kind of bothers me when people cherry pick or like, I guess I did it too myself, right. Talking about uh, you know, the 12th SS kind of on that death ride to Curtinville Farm. And then, you know, Les Maisonelles skipped my mind completely in that moment, which uh, is, like you just said, it's important to look at all of this. It's not just, you know, rah, rah, victory. Uh, there's mistakes made. Um, yeah. Mistakes or things are done too quick. They know they're sometimes they're making a mistake. Sometimes they don't. Les Maisonelles, they didn't know how yeah, bad it was well, going to go. But yeah. yeah. And I, I think the, I think Kurt Meyer can be criticized for overconfidence, for 100%, um, agree. thinking he could do more than he could. Yeah, Luminal Petrie is a, a problematic one. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think the Canadians were overconfident, but I honestly don't think they were expecting to fight um, in that village. I think it was no. just a waypoint on a, a journey, and they got ambushed and paid a big price um, because of it, and there was a whole bunch of failures in there, and that's sort of going to be the focus. Yeah, about. it's it's, uh, and I think yeah, I think Paul Wittish from World War II TV kind of jumped in on Twitter when we were talking about this. Uh, I can't remember a couple of days ago, saying it's all about the ground, and that's important, and you're going to do that uh, obviously because it's going to be battlefield stream live stream, which is awesome. Like yeah. mine will be tomorrow morning, so that'll be uh, a great to see that again. I haven't seen it in how many years it's been now, um, so it's just great to see these things. But again, keeps the context. At the forefront which i think is great um so yeah i think that's pretty much that's all i have i don't have any questions really that was that was great mike that's a great way of, of great yeah that sorry story. for uh, going on a little bit uh, oh that's all good back, but, um uh, we, the numbers pretty much stayed the same so i don't think we bored anybody away with yeah, going a little longer than they usually do <laughs> so that's great um but yeah that, that was fascinating uh that was great thanks for coming on mike that i really appreciate that i i Always your work. I know I keep saying this and it sounds like I'm one of your fanboys, but I kind of am. You do great work. Um, you do great stuff. You've helped me a lot. Um, so Mike's stuff is in the description below as well as Twitter, his own personal web page. He does map making. And again, he didn't tell me to plug this. This is all on my own. He went and made one for me on a very tiny little niche topic and it was amazing. Uh, so if you ever need anything like that, you know, get in contact. He's great at that. Uh, and some of his books are also uh, in the description, which are not about this, but I don't care. They're great anyway. So buy them. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so thanks, Mike. Uh, is there anything else you want to finish up on or is that all you got for us today? No, no, I think that's great. Uh, thanks very much for having me on. This has been a, a lot of fun. All right. So I'm just going to say goodbye to everybody and then I'll come uh, talk to you after. All right. Great. So thanks everybody for watching today. Um, that was really great to have the audience and some good uh, back and forth in the comments there, just some different questions. And I had Alex Black asking a question. He, I think he knew the answer too, but wanted to kind of get that going, which is great, but uh, thanks everyone. So um, yeah, so tomorrow morning, I will be doing a live stream um, with Paul Wittish World War II TV. Uh, the link is in the description. So check that out. If you're a bit of an early riser, not, you can watch it later, um, but it'd be great to have you there. So uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to be coming up with next. The first is ours video should be coming out soon ish. I'm having a bit of a struggle with it at the end, but I'll get that out as soon as I can. So thanks everybody for watching. Have a good day.